Well, we have a rather curious subject this morning, but I think it is one that has meaning and considerable contemporary significance. To study our heritage from the past is not simply a waste of time, because most of that heritage is still with us. If not in the political and social circles of life, at least in the internal subjective moods of our own existence. At a very early date, it became evident that the human being was in serious difficulty trying to understand where he was, what he was, and why he was. He looked around him and he saw a nature unfolding, but behind this nature, as he saw it, there must be something else but he had no way of really trying to discover what it was. He was bound within the small area of his own life existence. His expectancy in those days was very little. It is sometimes estimated that the average human being in those uh, early cave periods, life was probably about 10 years, maybe a few more. Many of them didn't reach majority at all. So, it was a strange world with everything happening and no explanation for why it happened. Gradually, it became obvious that the human being had to have some type of internal existence which would carry with it faith and hope in his material life. Gradually, we find the rise of various beliefs probably some of the earliest sort of shamanistic, the belief in spirits and ghosts, all this type of thing. All these believings came not from a carefully studied or planned exploration of nature. They came from a desperation of an individual or a group of injured individuals struggling desperately for hope, to escape from loneliness, to no longer be an isolated creature in an unknown world. The human being was very much like a castaway on a desert island. He had no resources available to him except what he could contrive with his own ingenuity. As time went on, there was inevitably a demand for some type of organized faith. Faith in realities that were not visible. But how was the primitive man going to analyze invisible realities? How is modern man going to analyze them? Actually, it all seems to have arisen within the person himself. The desperate need resulted in a kind of solution. A solution that was sufficient for the moment and which it was always hoped would be improved and perfected in the course of time. This temporary solution is still the answer that we have to use. But with all our progress, with all our skills, with all our intellectualism, the individual is still lonely. He is still comparatively helpless, helpless in a world infinitely too great for him. Now he not only has to combat nature or adjust to its circumstances, but he must try to survive the complex situations set up by human nature in this little thing we call the earth. So altogether, our beginnings of faith, hope, and love lie in the desperate need for something that was superior to self, something that was stronger than we are, some ever-present help in time of trouble. Trouble was common, help was scarce. The individual went through countless miseries and misfortunes, but there had to be some hope, something to sustain the struggling creature in its long evolutionary path. There came up, of course, shamanism, which we find among the American Indians, the medicine priest, with the rattles and the spells and the incantations, and with second sight and mysteries. 
who worked with the sick and gave hope of recovery. Then in other parts of the world, other types of help gradually evolved. But these different forms had their foundation in the human demand for hope. And the only way he could find hope, apparently, was through a strange contrivance with familiar and apparently hopeless elements. The American Indian in the Southwest, for instance, was very much concerned with creating charms, various good luck symbols, protective symbols. And yet he had no way of knowing, really, what would protect him or where he would find anything that was sufficient. So he made this move that has become universal. He said, here is a pretty little pebble. Here is another pretty little pebble. These little petals, uh, petals and stones and flowers and so forth are pretty. They're nice. But in themselves, they can't do any particular good to us. But now comes magic. If we took two of these objects and put them together and tied them with sinew and painted something on them, they suddenly became medicine. Magic was bestowed upon a combination of factors where it was not regarded as existing in the separate elements themselves. As a result of this, it gradually dawned on the human being that almost any combination of circumstances which he could contrive, if brought together, had a new meaning, a meaning that might contribute to his own survival. We know also that in most ancient peoples, there arose a class of medicine priests, of uh, sacerdotal spiritual leaders. Uh, these became the foster parents of humanity. Uh, the simple people depended upon these leaders for hope. And it became obvious that for some mysterious reason, these leaders produced remarkable results. These people, uh, they, these medicine priests, apparently perform miraculous cures. And even today on some of the Indian reservations, uh, white people in trouble sneak over the border and try to get an Indian medicine man to help them. They have more faith in him than they have in their own physician. Now these... Uh, the problems perhaps are well exp explained in the Bible where we find the definite statement that faith has helped to make us whole. Something to believe in, something that has hope, is a source of physical help. It helps us uh, de uh, reco recover from mental ailments, from emotional stress, and from physical disease. Faith is a tremendously healing power, the only answer we have to the destructive force of fear. So from faith came a great development of beliefs and ideals. These were not always provable or demonstrable, but that was not important. It wasn't whether or not you could scientifically sustain them. The real answer was, that people accepted them, believed in them, deposited in them hope for the future, faith in the power of something to protect. As time went on and religions and philosophies became more complicated, it was inevitable that efforts should be made to rationalize faith, to bring it under the control of reason. It was apparent that if the mind supported the faith, it was stronger. And so we have all kinds of philosophies, mysticisms, esotericisms, and every type of intellectual interpretation of natural phenomena. We have it today. But today we are in a little difficulty. Knowing that faith basically is the very cornerstone of survival, we find that many forms of knowledge, particularly scientific knowledge, exist largely to destroy faith. They want to take away from us the belief in those very invisible principles upon which we have learned to depend for 
peace of soul and peace of mind and peace of heart. So in this confusion, a great many persons have lost their spiritual orientation. They have lost their ability to accept the fact that there is a universal good, a universal reality, that life is purposed, that there are reasons for things. And as gradually the sciences limit perspective and force the individual into a constant acceptance of material things as the only realities, as this goes on, faith dims, hope fades away, and the individual is reduced to a state from which he escaped ages ago by rising above the level of materialistic uh, primitive existence. Now, in the course of all this problem, it, certain facts of human life became increasingly obvious, and these facts of life are perhaps somewhat summarized in our relationship with the mystery of death. It is a problem that the primitive man never could understand. He tried to dramatize this mystery. He tried to glorify it. He placed a, t a treasury of art, beauty, and wealth in the tombs of his kings. He did everything to imagine that man after death lived in a beautiful land, but he had no way of proving it. He had no way of justifying it other than by faith. But this faith was so important, so desperately needed, that gradually a new type of interpretation of life was built upon faith. Faith justified, not rationalized. It became obvious that there had to be some reason for existence. Materialism destroys that reason. Idealism supports that reason. And faith lingers and clings desperately to support, to something to make things better. Omar summarizes it in one of the core trains when he says, Strange it, is it not, that of those myriad few before us pass the gates of darkness through, not one return to tell us of the way that to discover we must travel to. This pessimism was something that sickened. Pessimism is always a disease. It never amounts to anything constructive. But pessimism is an inevitable result of a hard, sharp look at circumstances without inner enlightenment to sustain us. So the problem of building this inner light can become, can become very important to all of us. In the course of time, the ancients developed a way of tying divinity closer to humanity. It was rather obvious to most people, even when they were comparatively savage, that no deity could listen to all the prayers of mankind, could listen to the two or three billion prayers that go up now every day to some gracious providence for help, for something to build hope upon something by which the individual escapes the isolation of his own insufficiency. So gradually, the invisible world was organized, not by proof, but by necessity. This organization did, however, result in visualization, for the dreams that the individual had about the invisible world behind him and beyond him gradually came through in sleep patterns, resulting in an elaborate symbolism of inner survival. This is found in practically all the esoteric arts and sciences of antiquity that have descended to us. They have developed symbolisms of hope, symbolisms of survival, symbolisms of transformation, by which the suffering and ills of society can be transcended. In this particular phase of the subject, therefore, we have gradually enlarged the concept of God. We enlarged it in one way and reduced it in another. Certainly, we do not have the thousands of deities 
that arose in Oriental religions. But we do have a realization that there has to be something between man and God besides space. That this space, this interval of quality between our state and the divine state simply cannot be a vacuum. That in some mysterious way, the divine operates in the mortal existence. And in order to operate, it must have some instruments of operation. So we gradually developed in ancient times a belief in in tutelary deities, godlings of various kinds, deities of agriculture. The Romans had gods that lived under uh, the kitchen's floor to take care of food. The Egyptians had their deities who plowed the fields of Amentet after death. Everywhere there were godlings and spirits that came uh, to help or to be present. Folklore is loaded with these concepts. Where did they come from? They were not really simply projects of imagination. They were the visualizations of hope of faith, of the realization of a need and an inner conviction that there must be somewhere something to meet that need. Now, we're talking about long ago, but we are not talking about things that no longer exist. The needs of our ancestors are still exactly the same as our own. We have made practically no progress in the area of the fulfillment of internal needs, We have gradually tried to assume that they did not exist. We have tried to limit existence to a single life. We have tried to assume that everything is accident and that all traits are hereditary. We do not have any solution to the great hunger of the human being for inner strength, for the power to meet the pressures of a world a world around him, constantly betraying the world within him. In this emergency, we find, therefore, in every major religion of the world, a development of intervening deities, beings of various qualities that existed between the final ultimate theology and the common mortal life of man. In Christian philosophy and religion, these have generally been called angels or archangels. They were messengers of the divine. These, as messengers, became very important. They brought the legends and mysteries of faith necessary to the fulfillment of spiritual realities. There also arose the negative counterpart of these, For as the messengers came from above to bring light to man, so below human beings rose to high degrees of spiritual development, and saints and heroes began to intercede for human beings before the throne of deity. So a network of intercessions was created, a network of hope finally more or less justified by a a network of speculations. Now, as time went on, these speculations became more and more firmly established in the human mind, until in many instances, these are no longer speculations. They are now traditional facts that have come to us through the wisdom of our ancestors. Now, maybe these uh, facts are more factual than we like to realize because actually our best instrument to discover the facts of things must lie within ourselves. It is our own insight that is the nearest to truth that we can ever have. We can't find this truth out in the desert somewhere unless it stimulates insight. Unless something comes from within ourselves, the larger work cannot be perfected. In some cases, we have the rise of various orders of deities such as those which we find among the American Indians again. And even now in their religious rites and rituals, the Kachinas come from the mountains. And the human being wearing a mask 
and with certain ritualistic uh, accompaniments is considered to be a temporary God. And this faith is still held firmly in the American Southwest. It is held in Asia among the shamanism of Mongolia. It is still held in many parts of the East, even among highly civilized and highly uh, skeptical peoples. The belief, the realization of the mask cult is very strong and probably will be for a long time to come. I remember when I was up in the northern end of India towards Darjeeling that a group of Tibetan dancers came down to give a performance for the strange visitors from afar. Among the dancers was a little boy, probably five or six years old. Everybody loved that little boy. He was so charming and had such a quaint way of living and thinking and wore the cutest clothes imaginable. He was like a doll to the most of the people who saw him who came from outside of India. Then came the time for the dance, and the little boy put on a mask with a grimacing face on it and decked himself out with some regalia and started to join the dancers. And in the course of the dance, this little fellow danced over towards the visitors, the tourists. They immediately scattered and hid. The moment the mask was on him, those who knew the little boy were still afraid of him. This is a subconscious situation that apparently we have not been able to cure even now. So the masks appear in Egypt in the temple rituals. They appear in the dramas of Greece. They appear in the dances and mysteries of Tibet, Mongolia, and Bhutan. They are still used in Japan and China. They are found among the Incas. They are, were a part of the regalia of the Aztecs and the people of Central America. Mask dancers and costume dancers are still found in many parts of Europe. The whole situation is that with the change of perspective, the way of something that isn't normal or common is introduced, immediately there are strange inner acceptances. Something happens, and the individual is no longer oriented to the materialism which has gradually crept into his nature. Now, in the course of this same procedure, we have had a great roam, a roaming around of the mind in folklore, in emblemism, in symbolism, in alchemy, in Kabbalah, many of these things, where the individual, using ordinary elements, placing them in new combinations, causes them to become revelations of something superior or more important. Now, in the midst of all of this, we come to the classic Greeks. And in the classic case, of course, the most outstanding example of something is the spirit guide of Socrates. The uh, Socrates had a spirit that was born with him, according to his own statements. And this spirit was called a daimon. Our word demon comes from it, but it's not, it is a use that was made after it was assumed that all these pagan deities were devils. Actually, the demon was not an evil spirit but a friend, a guide, and a counselor. And wherever Socrates was in danger or difficulty, his spirit came to him. The demon or guardian appeared, and he writes about it, discusses it, and tells of the examples of its presence. When, however, the time came for Socrates to die, when it was ordered that he take the hemlock and die of it, uh, poisoning, he says that his spirit left him weeping. Uh, the spirit was no longer with him. I am Blichus in his study of the mysteries of the Egyptians and Chaldeans describes in detail these familiar spirits. And uh, gradually we find more and more discussion of them and uh, Paracelsus von Hohenheim and many of the mystics of the Middle Ages recognized them. They were also recognized by the early church that there was something 
that uh, came along and sort of protected and helped and guided and became an invisible parent to a visible orphan. Not necessarily because he lost his family, but because he was an orphan as far as his inner life was concerned. He was as a child left without parent. He was alone in a world, and he needed mothering. He needed someone to lean on. He needed something to strengthen and protect him in his efforts to live a good life. And so out of this came the concept of the guardian angel. The guardian angel, according to the stories about, about it that have come down to us, came into birth with the person itself. The, the angel came and remained with the person throughout life. And then uh, when the person died, the angel appeared to testify before the throne of deity of the virtues of the person it had protected through the years. Now, this concept was never officially part <coughs> of the uh, Catholic or early Christian church, but it was said to be of the mind of the church. That is, it was accepted. A, a feast day was set aside for it, and as early as in the 4th and 5th centuries, it was discussed by the early church theologians. The direct source of the concept may have been the various nymphs, and spirits of the Greeks. Also, the various guardian spirits and beings that protected a, a, the Egyptian living and dead. The direct form of it seems to have originated in Chaldea or Babylon. But there is no religion in the world of any importance today <clears throat> that does not have angels. They are found on the Buddhist monuments and in the beautiful Buddhist paintings and in the various statuary. They are found in China, in India, in Burma. They were very important in Persian, Persia. They occur frequently in the literature of the uh, Orthodox Jewish faith. They are part of the Christian story, and they find them arising if ever the human being has been in the urgent need of help. They are a very essential part of the basic philosophy of Islam. So everywhere there are the beliefs in these beings. Beliefs that there are beings that can help and can stay with the individual throughout life. These invisible beings are sort of guardians, protectors. They are foster parents. They are the proof beyond all doubt that the human being is never left without God and guardianship and without love. These beings are a kind of mysterious benefactors. Sometimes they are regarded as having come from some great heights beyond human understanding. In the uh, Christian and Jewish concepts, uh, the uh, angels are represented as winged because they are constantly able to travel inconceivable distances to fulfill the needs and missions. They are also bringers of enunciations. They are re revealers of great spiritual happenings. They are the sources of visions and all kinds of uh, spiritual experiences. The, the artists of the Renaissance and earlier have made some magnificent paintings of the guardian angels and of the angels of the presence. And the ancient countries believed that they had angels that guarded their countries. And it was long believed in the Jewish people that uh, Michael, the archangel, was the guardian of Israel. All these different beliefs finally came down uh, to a problem of seeking some form of rational explanation for them. To have a belief that goes all over the world, accepted by some of the world's finest minds, that is not provable or demonstrable in terms of fact is always a difficult situation to face. And yet it has not interfered markedly with the belief in these beautiful beings who are the particular custodians of the divine love 
sharing it with mortality and bringing it into the world. The Egyptians gave us some psychological clues to this situation. And also, we can come down now to the physical problems of today to see if we can understand the psychology behind this particular situation. Perhaps best expressed by one of the mystics of uh, Europe, namely, that where there is a great necessity, that it must be filled, filled. It must occur if it is necessary. And where there is a great need for some form of spiritual security, it is certain that nature bestows it. The only thing is, we are not quite wise enough or not open enough to understand what is actually happening. But here today, we are in a world of lonely people. People who are losing faith in themselves, losing faith in their society. Fear is becoming one of the most common of all emotions. We are more lonely, perhaps, than any time in the last 2,000 years. When we remember the journey of man, as described by Plotinus, where he said, life is a journey of the lonely to that which is alone. In other words, the individual goes to that which is the final supreme end of all existence, deity. And that deity, in a strange way, is also alone having nothing to depend upon except its own internal eternity. So in this uh, phase of the matter, it is natural and was natural throughout all the crowded and suffering periods of history for humanity to build some kind of an image of faith, of hope, of charity, and to gradually lean more and more upon this without really knowing what it was all about. And the proof of the existence of the guardian angel did come to a great many people. It came in strange ways. The fulfillment of prayer, the individual asking for help, depending only upon the help of the invisible, received that help. And as a result, it, it seemed inevitable that all this faith was real that all these hopes and prayers and divine expectations were part of a divine plan and not a mirage arising in the human mind itself. Actually, of course, there is no doubt in the world that the great benefit of the belief in the guardian angel was the fact that it strengthened character, that it provided inducement for virtue, that it made it easier to understand, easier to bear burdens, and to realize that no matter what happens, or how often it happens, or where it happens, no one is ever alone. We are never less alone than when alone, according to one of the poets. So this fact that we are not alone perhaps changes the entire destiny of many individuals. They suddenly feel themselves to have a strength that is not their own, a strength that is supported by a divine edict, by a divine presence, by something like an invisible mother or father that walks with them, that stays with them all through life. This comes up also, of course, in our Medist Buddhism, where the pilgrim going on his journey of pilgrimage from one shrine to another uh, well, wears a broad-brimmed straw or bamboo hat on which are the words that he walks with another, the another being the Buddha. So this another that is stronger than we are and yet is with us and is available to us night and day, anytime, anywhere, became the basis of a great deal of mystical experience. Mystical experience gradually bestowed upon this conviction dream and vision likenesses. Individuals saw these spirits. Paracelsus describes in detail all the nature spirits and the gnomes and the undines and the salamanders uh, that uh, ancients believed were the custodians of flowers and plants. The American Indian in the plains 
had his totems. He had an animal spirit that guided him. He had to go out and perform vigil and learn what animal was to protect him. And when he went in vigil, in vigil and had a dream of an eagle, the eagle became his protector for the entire lifetime. And he prayed to it and he recognized it and he thought about it. And he knew that the strength of the eagle was his as long as he kept the rules. Now this brings another interesting phase into the problem of the guardian angel. The effectiveness of this concept. This being that loved us would help always if we deserve it. Now this put a moral factor into the situation which is perhaps a greater moral factor than any other that we have ever been able to conceive in the search for integrities. It is true that we believe in a large remote way that the good life is the life that leads to salvation. But this is a very big thing and we don't understand too much about salvation either. But what we do realize or feel is that if there is something that is taking care of us and loves us and will take care and protect us if we keep its laws, and this is all right in our own hearts, in our own houses, in our homes, everywhere where we go, there is an immediacy about it that seems to have a tremendous uh, power of help. And, of course, there's another factor in the concept of the guardian angel. This angel knows everything that we do. Therefore, we may think we can hide, but we can't. We cannot perform in secret any act that the guardian angel doesn't know about. And sometimes children will actually ask the guardian angel to look the other way, but there's no proof that it does. <laughs> The, uh, the idea, therefore, is that there is a, a companion sent from heaven who loves us, who constantly guides us, who helps to make difficult problems more simple. And when the time comes for us to leave this world, we will then find that this angel has stood for us in heaven and has witnessed our virtues before the throne of the Almighty. We find in, the, in Matthew, for instance, that Jesus makes reference to the angels when he says that these angels, that every child who comes into the world has an angel, and that when the time comes to that child to depart from this world, the angel intercedes before it, before the throne of God. Therefore, we have an actual reference to angel protectors and angels born with children, actually in the words of Jesus. So these things become very interesting and very important in a strange and mystical way. Now, psychologists would explain it probably in the terms that we are now dealing largely with an aspect of our own subjective, submerged intellect, that we are really thinking out into the open, things that we have believed or experienced within ourselves. Science doesn't notice, however, that that is also the way we build great buildings, cathedrals, churches, monuments. Every advancement of knowledge has come from somewhere within and has become a protector for some weakness on the outside. Uh, the, from, the, from the inner, we seek protection for the outer.